So you've been listening to, uh, you are listening to Indie Live Radio. This is the daytime show, Friday morning. And that was just coming to the end there of an interview that uh, Val and I, Val Gold, my colleague here, uh, Val and I did earlier in the week with Ruth Wishart. Um, uh, if you were listening to it, or maybe you only uh, didn't hear all of it, but it's picking up on the background to um, uh, uh, our age group. So, OK, my age group, uh, the, the, more, oh, the older voters, we're still not convinced about uh, independence being the way forward for Scotland. Um, so we wanted to talk about to Ruth about that and now we're going to go live with uh, a panel of um, other uh, chronologically gifted voters, that was Ruth's phrase. Val and I are still here of course but we've got uh, four other people. So we've got Alan Logue, Alan is a convener of the uh, Pensioners for Indy National Coordinating Group. He's also uh, active in the Glasgow Group. We've got um, Julia Laurie, who's um, active in, very active in the Edinburgh and Lothians Group. We've got Lindsay Neal from Selkirk. We've got our Pensioners for Indy Group down there. And we've got Morad Mugo from uh, Dumfries and Galloway. So, Thank you all for being prepared to come on live onto Indie Live Radio. It's great that you've done that. So we thought we'd just kick things off and give each of you a chance just to, you know, just a couple, two or three minutes maybe about what you, what your own responses were to the things that Ruth talked about, um, maybe any other ideas you've got. So, and then we can talk about things a bit more generally in a more general conversation about the whole topic. So maybe Alan, do you want to start us off? Yes, good morning. Um, interesting interview, uh, a lot of things thrown up, but I think the upshot is it's down to our age group to persuade the others in our age group uh, to change their minds. Um, the idea that we... we get in touch with the, the younger voters who are in the predominance of the yes voters to convince their elderly grandparents, etc., to change their mind. But we also have to, I think, use emotional blackmail on our um, peers who are still entrenched in the, the no scenario. Um, the selfishness was mentioned in the interview. Um, we are a bit, I think, we're comfortable in our own surroundings and also vote uh, accordingly. As uh, Ruth mentioned, the pension situation where the security was involved. So I think we have to use a bit of emotional blackmail, um, maybe billboard campaigns and saying, are your grandchildren not fit to run your own country? Uh, something like that. Um, the reasons that they, they, our peers don't want to vote yes are multifaceted. Uh, my own um, mother voted no. She's 96. She voted no in 2014. Um, A, she didn't like Alex Salmond, but I think partially was the fear of um, coming out of the European Union. Because in 2016, she voted to remain in the European Union uh, mainly for the opportunities for the younger generations. Yeah, yeah, great. I think we've got to, our organisation especially, uh, and also since we can't go knocking on doors at the moment, need to rethink how we do things. But I, I think we have to go for the emotional blackmail right. and joining up with the youngsters. Okay, so emotional blackmail suggestion from Alan. We'll have to... Uh... We'll have to think about that one. We might need a new phrase. <laughs> Julia, do you want to do you want to say a wee bit? Yes, certainly. Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me on to your show. I absolutely agree with Alan. I think emotional blackmail is is a good way to go in in a kind way. And we've tried various things since the lockdown. We tend to walk every morning down for our paper and of course we pass a lot of other people who are retired and in their gardens. We try to strike up a conversation, Daniel and I, and we then try to bring it fairly gently round to politics 
And we've had some really interesting conversations and we're able to impart a certain amount of information. I do think our generation um, are selfish. I think they're okay. As was said in the interview, Marlene, that we've been one of the luckiest generations ever. Unlike both Hugh and Val, um, I grew up slightly differently, I would say. I grew up in a conservative voting household. I didn't go to university, I went straight into work. Um, and basically dad was always right. It was really as simple as that. I was a bit of a rebel, which didn't go down well. And I've always seen people from every walk of life and every color as equal. So again, that got me into trouble quite a few times. Um, I wasn't interested in politics at all. Daniel, whom I married when I was very young at 19, he's very, very interested in history. It's his hobby, world history, but particularly Scottish history. And I try to use this, the knowledge I've gained from him when I'm talking to people, because I think when you know the history of Scotland and England, it gives you a very different perspective on where we are now. I do have quite a lot of friends who are unionists. Some of them are not quite as friendly as they used to be, shall we say. But it is very much, I'm an all right, and their minds are closed. I have relations that don't want to talk about it, they're not interested. One relation actually said to me, how would we pay for our NHS? So unless a mind is open for you to give them information, it's very, very difficult to take it any further. The younger generation are extremely important. I think we do have to target them if possible. We did that a lot when we were out on the street, on stalls, we used to try and talk to the young people, make sure they were actually registered to vote, ask them to speak to their parents and their grandparents. Chances are I will never have any grandchildren, which is quite sad. But if I had, um, I would listen to them. And I think it's very important to, to for young people to speak to their parents and their grandchildren and explain it's their future. It is not our future. Not our we future, want to yeah. leave that for them, a better country. And a lot of people just don't, a lot of older people, and I would say you've got 20% older people that you, you're not going to get anywhere, but they don't realise the value and worth of their own country and their own people. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, so from there, maybe we go down to uh, Lindsay, you're, you're down in Selkirk. Do you, do you want to just say a wee bit about um, how, how, you've, how any ideas you've got on this subject? Okay, well, I think you can divide it into separate sort of areas. The first thing I think one has to try and decide is what it is that is inhibiting people. We're all obviously convinced, but what it is that's inhibiting people from espousing the idea of Scottish nationalism. Now, until we identify what it is that's holding them back, we won't be able to address it. The other two things that I think are important is to attend to the immediate future and evolve plans, aims and whatnot to cope with what's coming up, which is going to be an, a time of intense politicking and so on. But also, and very importantly, is to have a plan on a, of a long-term project, not a single project, but a long-term plan. I remember very clearly being in Massachusetts, staying at the house of an Exxon, um, <laughs> he was a high idiot, um, guy who was part of a little planning group that was planning on the economy, the financial aspect of Exxon 50 years ahead. So what we should be doing is having a plan for the long term for Scotland, so after presumably independence, but something that can appeal to people as something to strive towards. And in terms of the short term, not so much day to day and um, counteracting um, what is the, you know, the, the, the problem of the moment or the, the, the misinformation that's being bandied around. And as far as the identification of what is, what, what is inhibiting people is concerned, 
We've got to get our facts into plain, simple, straightforward language so that people can understand. And there must be reproducible facts because there is going to be immense misinformation abroad. It is going to so interfere with the concept of the United Kingdom if Scotland separates because of the income that um, in, well, the rest of the UK derives from Scotland. They are going to fight tooth and nail to stop us going away. So that's what I'd like to see happening, is to divide it into really three phases. First of all, identifying what's needed. Secondly, to attend to the immediate problem of, of um, getting more people voting for us and so on, and having a long-term plan. That's, that's really, that's that's a really interesting way of uh, thinking about it, Lindsay. We'll go, I'm no doubt we'll come back to that in a minute. Borag, do you want to uh, tell us a wee bit about what you were thinking? Hello. Um, just to put everyone in the picture, I live in Dumfries and I'm part of Dumfries and Galloway Pensioners for Independence. We've been out on the streets of Dumfries and across the region for the last two years with our stalls. And we don't have the kind of big aims that Lindsay's talking about, like policy aims and stuff like that, because that's for government, in my opinion. Um, what we tried to do was to normalise independence, just to be on the street very regularly. We had live musicians singing Scottish tunes, music. People always stop for that. And we're really just trying to, to say, look, we're just like you, you know, we're not, we're not funny, we're not weird, we're not different, but we do want independence because we think it's going to make Scotland a better place. Um, and it's, it's been pretty successful. We've really had very little argument with people. I mean, if they don't want to talk, they'll walk past, but it, it attracted a great many people. We made money at every stall, which wasn't the point, but it helped us to make more stalls, more tablet and stuff like that to, to sort of give away uh, and a chance to talk to people. And we attracted members every time we did it. I think we've got close to 100 members, something like that. To me, that's the past. We can't do that now and we can't do it for the foreseeable future. We don't know we'll ever do it again. We, we also have taken a view that we don't leaflet at the moment. We don't go to people's doors. Um, there's been a fair reaction to Mr. Ross's little present through the doors, and you can see why people don't like it. Um, so we don't, we don't think that's actually useful. We do a great deal of letter writing, not me personally, but people within the group, uh, and they get into the local press every week. And we get our views heard, which is amazing because I would say two years ago we couldn't get anything into the local press, but it seems to have opened up, um, and that's a good thing. We use social media a lot, but we're aware that the age group we're talking about here doesn't all use social media, um, although a lot of us do, many, many of us do. Um, but it's important to, to have that, to have a website which is informative and to have something that people come back to and look at. We have the Indie Van, which, um, or the, the Mobile Indie Hub, which was one of our members came up with the idea and has started it as a separate enterprise. And that just travelled across the region. It's got the Business for Scotland graphics on it, which is great because you can park it up somewhere. People will read it. They're not challenged by having to talk to somebody, but they get the messages just the same. So that's good. Um, we're thinking and planning now to have billboards across the region. And the theme for the billboards won't be Business for Scotland facts and figures, which personally I consider counterproductive because it, people, people can read that stuff, but it doesn't really register. For a lot of people, it doesn't. And we think it has to be emotive. It really ha has to play on people's feelings. Um, people are afraid of change. They don't like risk. They don't like change, especially older people. It's I been is what they say in Tafris and Galloway. Um, and that's the way they like it. But the world has changed. COVID has changed everything. People have had to change because of that. 
who've been listening to Nicola Sturgeon for three quarters of a year now and doing what she asks. And maybe because of that, they will be more open to the, the things that she might say next year. I don't know. But um, I think the billboards is quite useful. The, the idea that we have for it is to use uh, someone of school age or a wee bit older student, new student, that kind of age group, and speak directly to, to people just with a very simple statement and a photograph of this person who believes that their future lies in an independent Scotland. That's about it. Yeah, thank you. That's um, that. That's just really intriguing. I mean, it's just quite a sort of um, different kind of uh, ideas now about where we go from 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 where we are. Because you know, we've all be, we've all been campaigning. I, mean, I know there's the Selkirk Group has uh, uh, run a, a street stall in Edinburgh. You do you know all over Edinburgh and the Lothians. Same in Glasgow. So it's quite interesting to hear you, more I like, say. You down in Dunfees and Gal, you've decided not to do that any longer. I think Edinburgh have made the same decision. Is that right, Julia? Yes, we have. Edinburgh isn't as open as Glasgow. We don't have the nice big space that you have in Argyll Street. Uh, and actually, the footfall is now quite small in Edinburgh. We've been in during the week. And because the offices are all closed, there's basically folk just rushing from one shop to another right. and then going home. Yeah. So, but whereas in Glasgow, there's been, uh, a, we've, we've gone in a different direction. Do you, do you want to say a wee bit about what Glasgow are doing, Alan? Yeah, we've started up our stalls again. And it, the footfall seems to be just the same as it was in Argyle Street. Um, Mary had updated us on what she was doing. Uh, we're getting folk talking to the stalls. Everybody's keeping their distance. Again, but it seems to be working. Um They've had no bad reaction from it, so we'll keep it going to see how it goes. But Mary, uh, some of our team have also been out with the Oban Banner um, libraries. Uh, they take up a stance outside a park um, to get folk passing with their dogs to strike up conversations. With one member who's especially good at it, um, we're thinking of asking her to do a master class on it. <laughs> but she just strikes up the conversations with strangers, and there's been no antagonism or anything like that. So they they all keep their distance, and it, we're not handing out leaflets, of course, but um, it seems to be working. Yeah, it's because I I had my doubts about the, about when they started up the stall again in in in, yeah. in Glasgow, but as you say, it seems to be working. But I think for one of the one of the big keys in that is this National Banner Library, which if yeah. anyone hasn't heard about it, go on to a grassroots open website and there's a you can find the info there. So, you know, we, the, the big banners are two metres by one metre. You can put mountain park railings. People can read them from a distance, which is the big you know advantage. Uh, I know um, Sheena, one of our one of our stalwarts at the stall, she's probably the one you're meaning because she's fantastic about going yes. up and chatting to folk off the, off the cuff. But she was saying, well, you know, she notices that people can also read them from buses as they go by. Uh, some of them, some are better than, than others for that. So, yeah, so it's interesting, isn't it? It does seem to be mm. working. We, we did a wee uh, podcast about it, about campaigning in the new normal. Um, so, okay, so, so the, the campaigning and there's a decision about whether or not to start up um, um, in the way, so in some sort of mitigated, some sort of mitigated way. So, look, going back to um, Lindsay, what you said about why is it that people that were not convinced? I mean, I mean, I think we have to be careful about this because it's not as if our age group has stuck at the 24% yes that happened in 2014. It's up at about, well, depending on which, you know, varies a bit, but I, I've certainly seen polls where it's got it up in the low 30s, so 31%, even up 34%, which, when you think about it, that's, um, that's you know, a 7 8%, 9% swing. Um, you could win a general election on that if it was, you know, if it was over wide. But, you know, it, 
but we've kind of stuck with going, okay, that's still pretty small, and it is compared with the rest of the Scottish demographic who, um, you know, are all uh, over 50%. So that's that's where we are. And there was a, a bit of a polling that was done immediately after 2014 asking people what made them vote yes and what made them vote um, no. And for people who voted no, um, one of the big things was a sense of loyalty to Britain, to Great Britain. There was um so in a way that's a positive thing. I mean loyalty is, you know, positive um a positive uh state of mind. Um and then the other things were a bit more uh, things they were frightened about. So uh the the NHS and the economy and uh and, and pensions. So those were the things that stopped people some of the things that stopped people voting in two thousand and fourteen. Uh, do you think it's still those things, or do you think some of those have, you know, turned round a bit uh, these days? Yeah, Alan. Um, as I said earlier, there's a, it's multifaceted: the, the the pensions, the security. Um, but I think the EU may have changed uh, a lot of people's views. As I said earlier, um, we should we should be. I think we should be asking more of them to sell us the union. Um, they kept, we can all give, as, as Lindsay said, if we come up with a plan and this is what we think the future should be. But I think we should, in our conversations, we should be getting the no voters to sell us the union. Absolutely. To say what is good. Tell us why you won't move from no to yes. Yeah. Um, make them put the argument out instead of us having to put the argument out turn it round we were them talking, do it for it alan we were talking to gordon McIntyre kemp last week and he's got an interesting expression for that he, just exactly what you're saying he calls it a conversational jujitsu where <laughs> right. you use the force of the other people's no. argument again you know you turn it around you don't try and convince them you, you ask them to tell you yeah. it, Turn it round. So it's quite an. In I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, can they give us a five, ten year plan for the UK? There's no chance. I mean, if you can't give us a plan, the UK can't give us a plan for next year. No. But if they can admit that, that might change their minds or open it up. Mm -hmm. They have got. They have. They have got a plan. We got. We got. <laughs> we, got we got this through the post. It's a. Uh, it's uh, a little leaflet from Mr. Douglas Ross and. Uh, it's a bit of a change from uh, Baroness Davidson's um, campaigning style last time, which was vote for Tories to stop Nicola. Basically, that's what it boiled down to. And it, it's also a bit light. Oh no, actually, be fair. There are there there are some mentions of specifics, but the bit the basic mention is about um, let's not focus on old divisions. Let's open up opportunities and life chances for our. People, so he's obviously going for trying to present, you know, a positive spin on on the union. But but yeah, the jujitsu of turning that that round. I mean, you do have to be quite. Uh, I don't know. I I I go in stalls sometimes, and it's just I'm always a little bit out of my comfort zone. Yes. I'm I'm fine when I get chatting to someone. Actually, I quite enjoy that, and uh, I don't mind. You know, I'm, you don't expect everyone's going to agree with you, so I'm quite happy doing that. But the kind of initial making contact, actually, I do find that just quite difficult. If you're going to analyse what has prevented people from joining the nationalist movement, um, I think somebody has referred to the um, adherence to the idea of British nationality, which is a very strong yeah. motive. Yeah. And people of our age group, remember very well the different you know, difficulties that the nation has been under and the way that everybody worked together during the first and second world war and subsequently and this idea of separate nationalism or the british nationalism has been largely dissipated partly with the loss of the all the various dependencies and colonies and whatnot that have gone out. So the, the background is different, but the memory persists of the time when Britain was a stable, um, important country and so on. That has gone. Now, the, the further difficulty is that where people have made their minds up about a thing, 
for instance, who you vote for and all the rest of it, it is often extremely difficult to change their minds because it means they've got to conduct an effort of will to entertain all the different possibilities and make a judgment and so on. It is much easier to rely on the people you've you voted for in the past to carry on doing the job that you are quite happy with and gives you a comfortable sort of a lifestyle style. So that, that is two areas that I think gives us the, um, the, the areas that we could try and challenge in order to, to turn around the minds of those people who are dedicated against nationalism. That's the, the sort of background sort of thing I think of. Yeah. As far as the long-term plan is concerned, we should be, instead of talking, we can't for a start uh, rely entirely on the oil industry to sustain a country such as us, such as our size, but the alternatives, and, and Boris Johnson has stolen the march on us by saying we're going to make uh, Britain the, the, the world leader in wind power. Well, Scotland should be the, saying that, because we get more wind than anyone else. And um, we should be aiming towards doing things like that. And where possible, making it very cheap and attractive to use el electric power, which is sustainable and so on. Uh, these are the sort of long-term plans that we should be looking for. I've got a comment here on what you were saying there about the idea of Britishness. That's from one of our listeners, Fiona McGregor from Clark Manager Women for Independence. And she said her comment is Thatcher destroyed the idea of Britishness when she sold off BT, British Gas, British Steel, etc. Yeah, I've also got some questions here, um, Marlene, from yeah, Fiona. Cool. Yeah. To see what the rest of you, Alan, Morag, Julia, Lindsay, what mm. you think about this. Fiona's question is, I keep hearing about vague proposals to increase the pension to the EU average. And, and at the moment, we've got the worst state, as you all know, we've, but for our listeners, we have the worst state pension in the developed world. In 2016, and this is a statistics from Business for Scotland, a, it, the state pension was 29% of average income. The, the EU average is 70.5%, meaning that UK pensions receive more than two times less than comparable countries. So Fiona's question is, um, how likely is that that you know the the policy of the Scottish government to increase the pension to the EU average is that likely to be a game changer with our demographic? What do you think? Will I come to Morag first, maybe? Yes, it definitely would be. But getting the Scottish government to say they'll do it is another thing. Um, they can't. It was adopted as SNP policy at the most recent conference. It was. Yeah. Um, the conference is coming up, the online conference, in, <clears throat> at the end of November. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see what's in the manifesto. Um, I think members are being invited to submit ideas at the moment. Um, yes, obviously, that's... It's very, very simple. It really is. It's fear of change. It's um, food and shelter being secured, which means your pension, being assured that you will be still be okay. You know, yeah. you, you, it, it, yes, it, you can call it selfish, but it's just self-preservation, really. Yeah. Um, and if, if you can convince people that that would actually have a huge knock-on effect on the economy and it would help young people, it would create jobs, et cetera, et cetera, um, that's the way to go. It's one of the ways to go. Yeah. Thank you, Morag. What about yourself? Alan, I'll come to you next on that. About Do you think it's likely to be a game-changer? I think it certainly would, but it was just, uh, I'm sure in the Believe in Scotland conference, did Keith Brown not allude to the fact that something would be uh, put yep. in either a conference or the manifesto regarding that topic of the equalisation of the pensions? Mm -hmm. But yes, certainly I think it would be. Um, that would take away a lot of the fear factor. Getting that message out, isn't it, yep. to people? So Lindsay or Julia, um, We'll come to Julia and then Lindsay. Um, Julia, what do you reckon? Um, um, yes, I think it would be huge, but it's not just 
it's not just saying what you would do, it's convincing people that it will happen because people who already don't trust Scotland being independent will say, oh, that'll all change and how do we know that's actually going to happen? How can we afford it? That? It is a constitutional situation becoming independent. And yes, we've got the SNP and we need them to come forward with some more fixed policies, I would say, and that will help all of us. But you cannot, as, as Alan said, you cannot promise anything in the next five to 10 years. But you can promise them a country that's got some hope. And we haven't got any hope in Great Britain at the moment. So yes, I think pensions are incredibly important because lots of people only have the basic state pension and that's really grim. So yes, also I'd like to mention, uh, Lindsay was talking about a long-term plan. Commonweal have got a long-term plan. They've got a 25 year plan that I'd actually would like the SNP to adopt but it's worth everybody's while to have a look at it because it's absolutely fabulous. It's a long read, it's about six papers in it, but I would recommend it to anybody. Thank you very much, Julia. And Lindsay, maybe it's hard, it's difficult when you're last because maybe it's all been said, but have you got anything else to add there? We've got another question from Julia. Get the last word in anyway. <laughs> um, I, I, the important thing here is there's no question at all that if you offer people an improvement in their circumstances, um, they will be very encouraged to vote for you. But you cannot do that without having planned for the resources to be available in order, for instance, to give a higher pension to people, which is a, 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 a goal worth striving towards. And you cannot uh, create the resources if somebody is continually taking your resources away. And this is the situation we've got at the moment. We're only getting back about half of what the country's resources produce for the whole of Great Britain. If we had our control of things like the fishing and so on, we're going to lose most of that fishing. They're going to bargain it away. Um, the wind power thing is something that should be espoused and encouraged, and it would be a great money earner. Why do you think all these, these companies like, um, I can't remember the name, that come in and build wind farms? They do it because there are big profits to be made. There are big profits to be made for Scott. But one of the other problems there is that who owns Scotland and who would therefore profit from any income from Absolutely. wind generation, for instance? And it is largely not Scots. And these are things that have to be addressed. Yeah, so that 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 goes a whole into a whole other um, area about land ownership as well, isn't it? That's something I would like to see uh, being tackled in an independent Scotland, you know, as soon as possible. Um, Maura, do you had your hand up there? Yeah, um, the difficulty about about making promises on pensions is that we don't know who the government's going to be in an independent Scotland. <laughs> Um, the, the first step is to separate and have control of all our assets and all our finances and for a new government to be elected by the people made up of colours of the rainbow, whoever they want to have and then we can plan ahead after that. So it, although I'm, I'm saying the SNP aren't saying enough about what they, what they could offer, they really can't because they, they may not be the government later on. They're, they, and they're going to have uh, you know, a manifesto. I mean, all the parties will have uh, a manifesto, yeah. obviously, for, for, next, uh, for next May for Holyrood. But you know, looking after that, the first time we have a Scottish independence general election, everyone will have their manifestos there, won't they? And uh, actually, um, I mean, I, I agree that there's going to be a difficulty because uh, by the time we need that first general election, we may still not, you know, may still not be very clear um, what the finances of the country uh, are, are, are looking at. So I suppose that's that must be a bit of a, you know, a problem. I mean, you know, we've got the JERS figures at the moment, and um, I, I know that there are some groups in in yes groups that are currently trying to 
well, they are drawing up a set of figures that will be much better than the GERS figures. GERS figures have got some big gaps in them that um, most people don't know about because we just hear the headline, which is 15 billion deficit. Um, so there are people trying to come up with a, you know, a set of a bit more realistic set of figures. But um, and actually, it would be good if the SNP government that we've got at the moment went ahead and tried to do that because they did say they were going to do it, but they haven't got around to. It. I mean, fair enough. There's a health crisis going on, but you know, but still. Yeah. Um, Julia, uh, Julia, I wanted to go back and say, ask you, why do you think that no one would be able to promise anything for five years, or what? Why did you? Why do you think that? Well. Well, you can't make promises for a future when you don't know what government's going to be. Um, they have to say what they could do, what's possible with an independent country, with, you know, if we're in charge of all the levers, is a, is a favourite thing people say, if we're in charge of all that, then we have the capability, the capability to do this, that and the next thing. But there will be there will be a new government and I've got no idea, nobody does, about the parties that will spring up. What I would like to see is any party that wishes to stand in an independent must swear allegiance to Scotland first and not be trying to, you know, cause upset from the inside. I think that's extremely important and then we have to get behind them and and democracy. We, we need it, a situation where the people are closer to government and can make their own feelings and interests heard. At the moment, we, we just don't yeah. have that. Yeah. So Val, have we got any, you keep an eye on questions. Are there any, are there any other questions? Yes. Hey, there is another question here again it's from Fiona <laughs> um, and it's so it's quite a lengthy one so bear with me we talk about an aging population as if it's a bad thing uh, but that accumulated experience is a treasure trove the 60 plus folk that I know are all pretty active engaged in the community taking a keen interest in politics etc how could we value and make better use of this resource a senior citizens assembly would that help allay some of the fears of that group if they felt they had more of a stake in it and she says sorry it's a bit of a long question feel free to condense but I haven't condensed it because I thought it was quite a good question so how how do you think we can capitalize on all that great um experience um will we go the reverse order this time and go to Lindsay first is that okay oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much um <laughs> There is no question at all that there is a vast amount of expertise and experience among people who are advanced in years. The big problem is physical, you know, getting them to a point, getting them out of their houses and from in front of their tellies and whatnot to actually sit around the table and discuss things. You can do it perhaps in the morning and throw in coffee and cake and stuff like that to encourage them to come. But where, what is going to be the output of whatever decisions or whatever experience they throw at a problem, um, is it going to make any difference to, you know, what happens outside? Where is it going to be transmitted to? We've all got experience, I expect, of community councils, which are great talking shops and they deal with local problems and whatnot. But their actual power of getting things done is nil or virtually nil. So you've got to think about the actual practical steps of exploiting the experience and, and expertise that is undoubtedly there. And the other thing is, of course, some of us lose our memories and things like that, and we're not quite as sharp as we used to be. So you know, there are problems with that, but it could be attempted and it would take a bit of organization and some encouragement and also given some output power. Good, any other comments on the, the that one? Yep, Alan? I said, in principle, it sounds a very positive idea, but to me, the big danger of uh, taking one age group and setting up against another age group with, um, without putting too fine a point on it, um, we've had the most of our lives. The world is the younger uh, generation's life. Um, sometimes the younger generation don't like being told. Uh, if you want to take it forward, 
by all means encourage the elderly or our age group, let's say, to get involved with the younger groups, offering your advice within that. But setting up like a separate uh, thing, I think could do more yeah. harm than good, albeit the expertise is there. But I think that the group should be encouraged to mix and solve the issues that way, rather than having a separate yeah. more, more scenarios, let's say. Um, we've gone about this idea a wee bit differently in that for maybe the last six months um, before lockdown, uh, we were doing social groups, we were visiting uh, existing groups and associations, so like friendship clubs and things like that, and really offering them a, an entertainment package which had a wee bit of information buried in it. <laughs> um, so very soft, really soft, always music, a wee quiz, a Scottish quiz, and some sort of uh, stories maybe about the locality, the history, or something they might not know about, just to gently inform. And that was quite successful. You don't know whether it works or not. You've got no way of telling, but we were asked back, so we were obviously not too scary. Um, so we've done a fair bit of that, but on a personal level, level my husband and I, we, we joined, not for this, not as a political move, but we just decided to join some local dance groups, Scottish country dancing and round the room stuff. And you meet everybody there, every, all sorts of people. And many of them have um, a coffee break or a lunch break and you can sit and chew the fat. And they talk about all sorts of things and they're quite open to talking because they've just been dancing with you. So that kind of thing works yeah. really well. Uh, we can't meet people. We can't touch people. That's gone. I don't know how long it's gone for. So it, it's quite difficult um, to see how, how, how you meet them. Uh, the suggestion from Julia that, you know, you meet people when you're out dog walking and so on is quite good. Um, apart from that, it's very hard to see how you do it. I wear my yes badge normally everywhere and occasionally it will start a wee conversation. But um, being out in public spaces wearing a mask reduces the amount of commun communication you can have because you can't really see someone's expression. It's very hard to, to convey to someone whether you're pleased to see them or, <laughs> or whatever. Um, we're having to learn to deal with that. Um, smile with the eyes. So. Yeah, the lady at the checkout in the supermarket said to me one day, I said, I'm actually smiling at you, but you can't see. And she said, it's okay, I can tell by your eyes. So, so, but I think you've touched on something there, Morag. You actually touched earlier when you were speaking about something I was going to ask as a, a general question. You know, what do you think has been your most successful tactic so far? And you spoke very eloquently about, you know, the stalls and because because the area you live in is quite a tricky area. There's a lot of mm. uh, there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of Tory and unionist support down there. Maybe you'll be the same, Lindsay, down where you are. Um, I mean there is everywhere, but I think you're particularly up against that. But one of the things I was going to ask people is, you know, what have been in the past your most successful um a, campaign and tactics what do you miss most and also how do you th how do I think more you know you you've really cut to the chase there how do we how do we see campaigning as we go forward Marlene mentioned that here in Glasgow like some of the irrepressible Mary McCabe and she and Stephen have already restarted for some weeks now the stall in our girls street and they've also been using the yes yeah, so the grassroots open banner library so I just wondered you know what kind of techniques do you think um, might serve us well in the future uh, Morag seen as you uh, mentioned about your stall if you get any ideas how we any things we might manage to do? Um, we haven't considered having a stall again so far. We've, we've had a couple of Zoom meetings with the sort of 
wee group that manages the active group, if you like. Um, and various people within the group have conditions which would prevent them. Some of them are shielding our, our best musicians who turn out every time are in that position, um, which is awful. Uh, but we could consider something that they're like, instead of a stall, um, a kind of static display, but possibly with music, depending on the circumstances locally, um, just as a kind of sideshow. Like, like Mary and Tichina had with her banner, basically just standing yeah. with a big banner, you know. Well, kind of... It's got to be a bit nicer than that, um, I think. So you, would, you would have, what would you, you have music? Or... I think you need music. Um, Humour's a great thing too. Uh, we, we, we had a, a really good event uh, last summer, last year. Um, we did a whole thing about currency because currency is always a hot issue. But we discovered that Dumfries Museum has some amazing coins in its collection, Scottish coins, including an Alexander III silver penny, which was minted in Dumfries. So we, we got permission to use the images. We mounted an exhibition and we brought out a cardboard Robert the Bruce. <laughs> to um, just to advertise it and to make people laugh. You know, we could put the face through the, pit, through the hole, but the face would be, get their picture taken, that sort of thing. And we had a huge big coin, which would rolled up and down the street and got people to work out what it was. And a lot of people responded to that. Um, Any creative ideas that really well, are? It's really to say, yeah. we had this currency in, uh, 1266 I think it was and it worked it worked everywhere England had their theirs we had ours but you could trade on either side of the border with them and it, it all worked we had, that was really the beginning of Scotland if you like and there's no reason why we can't do that we, we shouldn't be afraid of it so but there were nice things to look at the, the coins themselves are beautiful they were tied to history and they were tied to different periods when there were different kings and queens so there was quite a lot going on in different levels. That was Julia. That ties in a little with what you were touching on earlier, Julia, about the history and the historical side, doesn't it? Yes, I think it is really important because most of my generation were not taught Scottish history at school. You had to go and find it and learn it for yourself. And as I say, I've got my own personal tutor in the house here, and. Um, it's it's really so interesting and it does make me feel very differently about it. Somebody once said to me, it's always been this thing between Scotland and England and you think, well, yeah, if you knew your history, you would understand why. But I love what Morag's group is doing. That is incredibly know, innovative. It's very innovative, isn't yeah, it? I think that's absolutely wonderful. We have discussed it, but... I'm finding that there's not many people in the Edinburgh group who are that keen to go out on a stall. And I think we need a minimum of four, mm -hmm. two to hold the banner and maybe a couple to distance themselves a wee bit. But I don't see any harm in going out in the street. And OK, so you stand and maybe get a bit chilly for a couple of hours. But I do, I do miss the conversations, I must admit. And maybe some interesting comments we get that maybe aren't so friendly. But you're with your own people, you're with your group. Yeah, yeah. I do miss that very, very much. I know, I, I used to, I, I, I have been on the pensioners for Indy stall a fair bit, but I've got arthritis, so I'm not very good at standing for long periods. But I've, the last five years, I've been involved with SMP stalls. Uh, and that's kind of different because I've got my wee folding seat. <laughs> so I, I have a sit down every now and again, but I love doing the stalls. I think, as you say, you do get um, some, you get your occasional um, bit of hassle, but that's much outweighed by a lot of the very positive um, feedback you get. And just the visibility, I think, is really important. Um, I think it is. And where we stood in Castle Street once or twice, you do get all the buses going along. Princess Street, I think visibility is incredibly important. And even if it's people who believe in independence already, they love to come up and just have all their beliefs 
discussed and, and talked about and I think that's also important. I think folk like to know that you're out there and you know like we've got bunting we put up in the tree and um, you know we give out pens and wee badges and if we've got wee things for kids Mar Mary used to be a great one for giving out balloons she used to chase the kids up and down the street to give them balloons but I, th I think balloons are a their sort of a persona non grata now because the the single use plastic but um, anything now that you touch you can't yeah, really exactly. you know leaflets yeah. I'm not yeah. sure but even leaflets you know, anything that transmits something between people, it's no yeah. use now, can is I, it? Can I come in? Because, you know, thinking about what we what we have been doing, well, in the Glasgow group, and I know in Edinburgh as well, what we have been doing that's, 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 um, that's new is, so instead of us meeting in a pub in the middle of Glasgow each month and getting maybe 20 people, something like that, which actually is not bad given it's month in, month out. So now it's all happening on Zoom. And uh, and we, we you know we send it in. We let the people know on our all our mail list, not just the Glasgow mail and pensioners for Indian mail list. So so we have these Zoom readings, and actually they have been very successful. in you know in terms of educating ourselves and hearing other people's you know approaches, um, Craig uh, Lindsay Craig uh, D L from Common Wheels, one of our favourite kind of speakers, and he always has got something that's about the long term plans. Um, but you know that's actually given people access to our meetings who would not have got themselves into the middle of Glasgow for a, for an afternoon either maybe because they're just not you know physically able enough or you know they're, they're a wee bit too far out to think about doing that so in a way it's opened us up and in the Glasgow meetings we get oh what well, Alan we get 50 60 people sometimes coming in uh, so, it, you know, that's actually been a benefit. But the trouble is, of course, it's it's always people, well, pr predominantly people who are already convinced. Yeah, yeah we've 70 <laughs> um, links gone out to today, for yes. today's meeting. So we get yeah, a fair yeah, number. It is. It, it, is hard, it is hard to see ways forward, isn't it, to new ways of campaigning when it's, it's quite poignant. I was quite uh, touched, actually, more like when you sort of, you know, said what we know, but you said it, which we can't touch, you know, we can't touch people. We can't, you can't just be chatting to people and they crack a wee joke and you put your hand out on their arm and, you, you know, you just yeah. can't do it. You wouldn't even be within an arm's length. And it's actually very poignant, that, isn't it? I mean, it, it's a loss. There's a big yeah. loss uh, to that, you know. I mean, not just for us campaigning, but just for being human beings, really. But, yeah. 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 But it makes it very hard, even harder now, to reach those that uh, are not voting yes. Uh, if they're not going to come, if they know voters are not going to come and talk to you, how do you reach yeah. them? Yeah, and, and I, uh, I, it makes it very, I, very I difficult. I think that from point of view of pensions for India, I think, you know, if someone's starting to ask questions about themselves, questions yeah. about India and in our age group, and they start looking online, they'll find us because we are quite, our groups are quite yeah. active, you know, all over. I mean, I don't know, it's something like what, nine or 10 groups. They, they'll find us and they'd find us social media, you know, the, the, the various websites, Facebook pages. It's, yeah, it's getting to the people who are not quite at the curious enough stage yeah. to Google, you know, older voters, independents, yeah. <laughs> something like that. But Again, going back to something you said, Morag, uh, more a wee while back, you know, getting messages out that's just a message from a youngster about to, to an old, older, to the older generation, just saying a simple, this is why I want Scotland to be independent. Maybe that is the way to go and, you know, get make sure that, our, and I haven't got any grandchildren, and, and if I did, they'd be living in Oxford, but, <laughs> uh, you know, Maybe getting the, the younger people that we know, make sure they go and they talk to their aunties and their grandparents and, and, and start up some sort of conversations. Maybe that is the way to go because that can be done kind of at a distance. Yeah. Where, where I am, um, I've got three Tory elected representatives. We've got Alistair Jack, we've got David Mundell, and we've got Oliver Mundell. Oh my and the Mundell uh, business 
spends a lot of time visiting old folks' homes, buying raffle tickets, drinking tea, <coughs> and having a nice time. Nice people. Um, our two SNP MSPs, Emma Harper and Joan McAlpin, work incredibly hard on behalf of not just the constituency, but Scotland generally. They, they really work very hard. But you don't hear about that much in the press. What you hear is so-and-so has been to somebody's tea dance or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, it's a different way of, of doing politics, but it works with older people. It apparently does work with older people. The other thing to say is that they have got very, very deep pockets and they can afford to put rubbish through your door every day of the week, courtesy of the postman, which costs thousands. I mean, I know because we've looked into inserts into papers and things like that, and it, it's extremely, we can't do that. We can't match the money ever. What we were able to do in the past was we had people on the street and they didn't because they couldn't find anybody to do their dirty work but we had lots of volunteers um the volunteers are still there they, they all still want to do um things that will help so yeah the, the, we, so far we haven't opened up the zoom to the whole group um because it's quite difficult to manage when there's a lot of people, but probably just if they just listened for the first few, few times, that might work quite well. It might get them more involved. Yeah, well, I uh, must admit, we did uh, think it would be a difficult situation to manage a lot of numbers on in Zoom, but it actually worked quite well if you enforce the discipline. When mm. we have a talk, uh, we always start the talk by saying there'll be questions at the end, but use the chat function. Then we have the talk, and yeah. then when the time comes, the questioners are invited to ask their question. And it's it's there's a good discipline there, and it works very well. So I'm um, we're I'm just so, looking at the time here. It's it's uh, it's nearly one o'clock, which is where we sign off. So, uh, do do you, let me just have a each of you have a you know couple of sentences just to give a final word that you you'd like to say if you 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 up for that anyway any before you all rush off to the get your last pint in the pump <laughs> yeah. i wish <laughs> i'm only joking. yeah before we go into sober october completely uh any any last we thought you want to check in I it just seems to be a, a very onerous responsibility in our age group to convince the, the majority of our age group to vote yes. And that way it might swing yeah. the whole vote. Yeah. Good. Uh, to, yeah. Go on, Maura. To go back to Ruth's, some of Ruth's suggestions, um, she, she's very expert in doing podcasts and doing and broadcasting as well. She's the right age. She's got a long history of journalism. She's quite well known, very well known, well thought of. Um, you've done one interview with her, but you could maybe think about speaking to her about short, short wee pieces that could go out that people could listen to. Um, we, we, we can't break through the media, the BBC, the STV and all the rest of it and Sky. We just they won't carry the stuff, so somehow we've got to raise the profile of this kind of platform and getting people like Ruth to, to do a wee bit more would yeah, maybe that's, help. That's a good idea. Ruth, Ruth said she might yeah. listen, might try and listen into this conversation today, so if you are listening in, Ruth, we'll be in touch. Julia, anything <laughs> you want to... I would, I would just like to say I think we all have to try and be as positive as as possible, take any opportunity you can to speak to anybody and um, ask your friends who are already supporters to to speak to their friends, to keep keep spreading things. And come the 1st of January, I think if we're going to be honest, the government in Westminster can do whatever they like. I'm not I'm not pinning the house on an election next year with the way that the Westminster government have been acting. I wouldn't put anything past them. It's a long, long time till next May. I think we have to do everything we can before the 31st of December yeah, this year. Yeah. 
it's um it, it it's a bit of I think that whole you know switch over and the, it's going to happen on first of January with or without any kind of you know deal, is uh on the one hand exactly what you said at that point anything can happen or at least a lot of things could happen to Scotland that Scots don't want. On the other hand, just to flip it, in the first month of January it will become a lot more obvious the consequent the immediate consequences of um having you know thoroughly and finally finally left yeah. the eu so that might even actually start uh, bringing more people yeah. uh, round round to yes Absolutely. whether whether it's in our <laughs> age group or not but um you know it, it might just be like that anyway that's a whole other topic that we could talk about but unfortunately don't have time to talk about it this morning but and you know and I, and we haven't sat here and come up with a definitive answer about how to reach out and um persuade other folk in our bit of the demographic but i think we've come up with a good few good ideas we've added in ideas to you know what ruth touched on in her interview and um you know, maybe the most important thing actually is what's been said a few times this morning. Um, it's it's maybe it is up to us to persuade our fellow, you know, over sixties, yeah. over sixty fives, over seventies, whatever. So, uh, thanks all four of you for coming. Really appreciate that. And we might try doing this again. Actually, if there's another, uh, if it was another obvious um uh, reason for for getting us all together again. So once again, Alan, Julia. Lindsay, Warag, thank you for coming on the show. Really appreciate it.